Hi, everyone. I'll give more people a moment to join us before we start. Welcome. I'm Julia Erdesey, and I am delighted to welcome you to this program, Cassatt's Hands, Labor, Skill, and Creativity, the Ida G. Diskant Lecture. This program is in conjunction with the exhibition Mary Cassatt at Work, which is on view until September 8th at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. I'll start with a land acknowledgement. With gratitude and humility, the Philadelphia Museum of Art recognizes Philadelphia as part of Lenape Hoking, the ancestral homelands of the Lenape peoples. A long history of broken treaties, forced migrations, and fraudulent agreements, such as the Walking Purchase of 1737, displaced many of the Lenape from this land. This museum and our staff strive to understand our place within the legacy of colonization and to act as allies to Lenape people and their vibrant communities today, including the federally recognized nations, Delaware Tribe, Delaware Nation, and the Stockbridge Muncie community. We pay honor and respect to Lenape ancestors past and present by committing to build a more inclusive and equitable space for all. Again, I'm Julia. I am the coordinator of adult public programs at the museum. We would like to thank and celebrate Robert and Ida G. Diskant and the entire Diskant family who set up an endowment to honor their parents through this lecture series that focuses on European art between 1100 and 1900. Ida G. Diskant was a highly regarded Sorbonne-educated scholar who did so much meaningful work here at the PMA. We're grateful to the Diskant family for their support and for this opportunity today. And now to introduce the panelists. Laurel Garber is the Park Family Assistant Curator of Prints and Drawings and is one of the co-organizers of Mary Cassatt at Work. A specialist in 19th century French works on paper, Laurel earned her PhD from Northwestern University. She's worked on a variety of projects since joining the PMA in 2019, including her first exhibition, Emma Amos, Color Odyssey, and a forthcoming show on drawings and prints by the 20th century American artist and illustrator Wanda Gang. Terry Lignelli has served the museum for many years, currently as the Aronson Senior Conservator of Paintings. In collaboration with Jenny Thompson, she led the conservation team in the preparation of paintings and frames for Mary Cassatt at work. A considered study and treatment of all eight PMA Cassatt paintings was undertaken, resulting in renewed presentations of these works to bring them collectively closer to the artist's intentions, closer to how Cassatt would have wanted them to be seen. Tom Primo is the Charles K. Williams II Senior Conservator of Works of Art on Paper at the PMA. He has previously held positions as Senior Paper Conservator at the National Archives and the Director of Conservation and Paper Conservator at the Baltimore Museum of Art. He received an MA in Art History from the University of Michigan and an MA in Paper Conservation from the State University College at Buffalo. Jennifer A. Thompson is the Gloria and Jack Drozdick Curator of European Painting and Sculpture and Curator of the John G. Johnson Collection. She is Head of the European Art Department at the PMA and Curator of the Rodin Museum. She earned her MA and PhD at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. Since joining, the, uh, since joining the PMA in 2000, she has published widely and curated many notable exhibitions, including Mary Cassatt at Work 2024, The Impressionist Eye 2019, and Late Renoir 2010. Welcome all of you. Before we get started, I have a few notes to orient everyone to today's program. The panelists will present and have a discussion for about 40 minutes. We will have time at the end for Q&A. Please put your questions in the Q&A box, which is separate from the chat. Questions that are upvoted with a thumbs up will go to the top of the queue. 
You can turn on closed captioning by clicking on the CC button in the Zoom toolbar. The chat is open and we encourage you to say hello there. Finally, this program is being recorded. The recording will be sent to everyone who has registered for the webinar. And with that, I would like to ask Jenny the first question. Jenny, can you tell us about some of Cassatt's depictions of hands? Great, absolutely, Julia. And I'd love the, the first slide, if you could, to give me to give us all some of Cassatt's hands to look at. In, in Mary Cassatt's pictures, hands, as you see, are very rarely idle. Instead, they're living, active body parts that tend to signal the busyness of her subjects. They might hold a newspaper, strum the strings of a banjo, thread a needle, or ply a crochet hook. They're frequently found at the center of our compositions, and these hands help us to recognize the moment in time and the task that is quite literally at hand. Next slide, please. But Cassatt's hands are rarely for formulaic. There's enormous variety in their depiction from detailed, richly textured and colored hands that are made up of layers of oil paint with near portrait-like precision to hands that are composed of a few suggestive brush strokes or lines of an etching needle. Of course, attention to hands is a long part, part of a long tradition. Portrait painters have for centuries focused on getting the heads and the hands of their subjects right, and often very well-established artists would focus on the heads and the hands, leaving other areas of portraits to be completed by studio assistants. But for Cassatt, hands are less about portraiture, though in fact, some family members of her subjects would recognize the hands as being quite lifelike and personal. Hands for Cassatt seem to be more about telling her story and revealing work, both her work and that of her models. And if we may have the next slide, Julia. A case in point is The Child's Bath, an oil painting of around 1880 that today is in the collection of the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. And in it, we see a child slumped in its caregiver's arms this is a drowsy, restless child, has a slightly annoyed look on its face, and it gazes upward at a woman. And as our eye moves from the child's face to the mostly obscured head of the adult, I think we are then subsequently guided down the woman's arm to her hand. And it is a hand that, in, in my opinion at least, steals the show. Maybe we have a detail, um, Julia, the next slide gives us a nice detail. Yeah. So the hand is reddened, dipped in a basin, and clutches a white cloth. Dark outlines and dots of bright pink and red paint accentuate the edges of its digits, and they contrast with the really vibrant and lively paint surfaces surrounding the hand. It is, in fact, one of the most still and detailed passages of the entire canvas, unlike, to my eye, the little foot that is just inches away a foot that is comprised of just a few strokes of what appear to be blurry paint. This juxtaposition, I think, can be no accident, and it adds to the kind of dissimilarity or disjuncture we feel when considering the working hand alongside the other objects in the picture. And Julia, would you mind going back one slide to give us the full view of this painting? Thank you. So in this painting, we see sort of objects of comfort and wealth, a blue and white porcelain bowl, a stuffed comfortable armchair, or a vibrant wallpaper. And these all suggest a very comfortable home. And they force us to question whether this woman dressed in practical white garments is the mother of the child or perhaps a nanny who is paid to bathe and to care for the child. We have the next, actually, jump forward two slides in our, our deck, please. Thank you, thank you, Joan. Reddened, calloused hands that have seen a good deal of life and labor are frequent in Cassatt's pictures. A contemporary critic, Felix Fagnon, called them out in an 1891 interview, describing the large, the beautiful masculine hands that Cassatt loves to give her women. He noted that they have 
decorative functions, especially when they are set against the nude bodies of children. They disturb the outlines, then combine them with them in the unexpected creation of arabesques. And I agree with Fenuel that the interplay of young and old hands is a fascinating and particularly enjoyable aspect of Cassatt's work. But these hands are also often at odds with their comfortable settings and the fashionable garments that we see in these scenes. And they seem to suggest that Cassatt is deliberately breaking the fiction of these upper class domestic scenes by depicting the work worn hands of her models, women who often used their hands to make livings as to make a living, sorry, as nurses, maids, or seamstresses. In 1911, one friend of Cassatt's, the American architect Theodate Pope, questioned this disjuncture, dissimilarity between fashion and the working class models in Cassatt's pictures. And in a reply to her, in a very spirited reply, I might add, Cassatt wrote, so you think my models are unworthy of their clothes. You find their types coarse. I confess, I love health and strength. What would you say to the Botticelli Madonna at the Louvre? Julia, may I have the next slide? The peasant girl and her child clothed in beautiful shifts and wrapped in soft veils. Yet, as Degas pointed out to me, Botticelli stretched the love of truth to the point of painting her hands with the fingernails worn down with field work. And we're looking here at a detail of that very picture that Degas and Cassatt must have looked at closely together at the Louvre. And it reveals a bit like Cassatt's pictures that hands are an important site in Cassatt's work that reveals the activity, strength, character of the women that she, in the world around her. And they're also, I think, places where we see Cassatt's own artistic handwork showcased. And I suspect that my colleagues Curator, fellow curators and conservators are going to take up this subject um, in their in their mini essays on hands. Thank you. Thank you for that, Jenny. Um, and now a question for Terry. Terry, can you speak about what Cassatt's brushwork reveals? Sure. Thanks, Julia. Well. From what I've seen of Cassatt's paintings, could I have the first uh, slide, please? Just a moment. That's it. Okay, thanks. Uh, well, from what I've seen of Cassatt's paintings, her brushwork reveals the technically skilled hand of an exceptional artist. Her surfaces display a remarkable dexterity in manipulating paint to depict materiality and create special effects, including expressions of movement. As seen in these two details, her brushwork is layered and complex, inviting close looking to decipher her varied methods of paint application. Next slide, please. I remember two years ago when we first started our focus looking at the PMA Cassatt paintings. Her textured paint surfaces revealed by raking light were a great surprise. This examination with the paintings illuminated from one side at an oblique angle showed the physicality of her art making and was the initial indication that the project would be an interesting study. Next slide, please. We were impressed by Woman in a Loge and the impasto Cassatt deliberately used to define the necklace's individual pearls. Doing so created light catching texture that was perhaps intended to take advantage of illumination from the apartment windows where the picture was first exhibited in the fourth Impressionist exhibition. Next slide. Over the course of this project, we've marveled at the breadth of Cassatt's brushwork vocabulary. This detail of maternal caress on the left shows her deliberately working the thick paint surface using her brush 
or perhaps its pointed handle to amplify this puff sleeve, both visually and physically. The detail on the right shows Cassatt's impostoed approach to painted flesh, which paralleled her pastel technique at this time. Next slide. You can view this similarity in the childcare gallery of the exhibition, where woman and child hangs next to baby John nursing, a pastel on canvas. Both were done about 1908. This raking light detail is published in the exhibition catalog and is a useful reference in comparing the two works while standing in front of them. Next slide. As conservators, we spent a lot of time with the PMA Cassatz over the last two years leading up to the exhibition. Seeing the paintings unframed is a particular experience that allows an uninterrupted view of the entire surface, edge to edge. Without the visual distraction of a frame, any frame, even the green one, you're able to focus on the brushwork. Looking and then looking again and again over time is revealing as we continue to learn Cassatt's artistic language. And as often happens with the paintings we've got on our easels, the many hours of close looking at brushwork during examinations and treatments inevitably leads to choosing favorites. Next slide, please. One such is the L-shaped brush stroke along the edge here, just above the hand. It's a confidently placed mark that suggests the movement of Cassatt's brother's hand as he rustles his newspaper. For me, this single vigorous brush stroke animates the scene and conveys narrative action. It has an exclamation point feel to it, and I can almost hear the snap of the paper. Next slide, please. A relevant, there's a relevant quote from Louisine Havemeyer, Cassatt's close friend, that supports and clarifies our observations of Cassatt's depictions of movement. Louisine writes, quote, it seems to me I could write a textbook on art only by repeating her aphorisms, her terse sapient counsels on the science and the difficulties of the professions. For instance, in expressing a movement or a gesture, she would say, you must make the cause as well as the effect felt, as well as the result felt, or it would not tell the story. As seen here, Cassatt tells the story really well, using blurred brushwork along the edge of the woman's chin to depict the movement of her head, resulting from the child's pushing hand. Next slide, please. In this detail of Woman in a Loge, Cassatt's agitated brushwork along the edges of the hand and folding fan animates her sitter, creating the illusory moment movement of the woman jiggling the fan on her lap. Long curved brush strokes below the hand accentuate the motion of what this woman is doing in the narrative. Next slide, please. Cassatt masterfully tells another story in the child's bath using varied brushwork that merits a long look and close study. Before its arrival for the exhibition, I had read about this painting, but had never seen it in person. Viewed on the wall, the chair and upper background show nice examples of Cassatt's diagonal hatching and zigzag mark making that are usually much easier to recognize in her pastels. But what caught my attention were the blue brush strokes, drawing really, used to reinforce the contours of the child's legs, but also to express their movement I'm pointing to one of them on the left. Next slide, please. These blue strokes speak to me as indicating the position of the legs before the child was hoisted onto the woman's lap. To my eye, this brushwork deliberately contributes to Cassatt's narrative of the strength and patience needed by this woman to position the child and hold them in place for bathing. Next slide, please. Cassatt's paintings speak for themselves and are best heard in person. Her captivating brushwork will surely inspire and I encourage you all to visit the exhibition. Mary Cassatt at work has been beautifully curated and designed for close looking. A slow viewing pace is recommended. You can rest on a bench along the way, circle back to take a second look. And if you add in the air conditioning, it's a nice way to spend a summer afternoon. Thanks, back to you, back to you Julia. Thank you so much.
And now, Laurel, can you give us a sense of the manual labor involved in making a print and also the way that gender relates to analysis of Cassatt's hands? Yes, thank you, Julia. I hope you can all hear me. If not, Julia, just let me know. Um, I will take my first slide, please, and um, jump right in. So perhaps nowhere in Mary Cassatt's body of work is the labor of her art making more evident than in her prints, where her approach to process takes center stage. From her earliest etchings to her advanced color aquatints, we can see Cassatt not only delighting in the properties of printmaking, its rich tonality, its fine linearity, its seemingly endless capacity to be reworked, as I'm showing you here, but also using it to showcase her own rigorous and iterative working habits, her own active hand at work. In my very few minutes today, my hope is to show how our exhibition's focus on Mary Cassatt at work can help illuminate her hand in printmaking in particular. I'll have the next slide, please. Oh, next one, sorry. And then the next one. Cassatt didn't produce a print until the age of 35, years after permanently settling in Paris. And over the decades that followed, until her failing eyesight prevented her from working with the glare of shiny printmaking plates, Cassatt undertook major printmaking projects, acquired at least one printing press of her own, and produced a total of 215 printed subjects. In many of these years, Cassatt exhibited more prints than paintings, and her first solo exhibition in 1891 starred her groundbreaking set of 10 color prints. Actually, Julie, if you could go back one slide, um, and you'll hear more about these in the next presentation from Tom. The many existing preparatory drawings, working proofs, and anecdotes from her letters testify to Cassatt putting in as much labor into her prints as she would a painting or pastel. Printmaking became a pivotal site for her for exploring the matter of work that so absorbed her, of the woman around her, of her models, and of her own activity and ambitions. So today I will very briefly introduce Cassatt's hand in print, first in the late 1870s in the Impressionist vein, as she was learning the ins and outs of a new medium. And then a decade later, as she mined the possibilities of the dry point print technique in her pursuit of new subject matter. I'll then pass it over to Tom Primo, our paper conservator, who will provide more detail about what we've been learning internally about Cassatt's print techniques, and especially her watershed series of color aquatints that I'm showing you here. I'll have the next slide, please. Next one. A painter by training and reputation, Cassatt would have been exposed to some printmaking instruction early in her life through her arts education at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, just down the street. And it would have been also familiar to her as both a drawing room activity and an avenue for women artists to publish their own pictures. But Cassatt's artistic ambitions were greater than a professional illustrator, and she showed very little interest in printmaking until 1879, when her peers Camille Pizarro and Edgar Degas proposed a collaborative printmaking project. At the close of the 1879 Impressionist exhibition, the artists decided to continue working together to maintain the momentum of their critical success. And so Cassatt accepted their invitation to participate in a publication called Le Jour et la Nuit, or Day and Night, which was to be a regularly issued periodical of original black and white prints, I'm showing you some of them here, that sought to link the related trends of Impressionism and modern printmaking. Next slide, please. For months, Degas, Cassatt, and Pizarro worked together intensively preparing etchings for the journal. Cassatt was drawn to their methods, which adapted the more creative and spontaneous processes of painting to printmaking. Next slide. As Cassatt moved between these media herself, she brought with her a love of the manipulable surface and variety of texture and tone that she found in printmaking. She was willing to draw, scrape, dust, heat, bite, and work her printmaking plates to realize in them the extended range of expression and effects that she knew was possible from her work in other media. Next slide, please. Etching is one of the most physically demanding printmaking processes. 
It involves a material and chemical transformation, acid eroding metal, heat fusing and melting, intense pressure to transfer matter from one surface to another. It's also a, a practice or an operation that involves the etcher's body as she incises, submerges, lifts, inks, presses, and moves between the plate, the acid bath, and the press. Next slide. And whereas a finished painting tends to obscure the signs of its making, an etching can preserve and reproduce the probing intermediate stages of an artist's creative practice. While working on and making changes to a printing plate, an artist can ink and run it through the printing press to check how it appears once printed on paper. And that's what I'm showing you here, these progressive proofs. These unfinished works in progress can capture the entire working process behind the finished object. And many of the Impressionists, and Cassatt in particular, found Prince's capacity for testing and preserving the artistic process to be deeply generative. A restless experimenter, Cassatt was alert to the material possibilities of printmaking, making working proofs in the course of her creative production. And more remarkably, she often saved these impressions, signed them, and even exhibited them, clearly finding value in them as records of her hand at work. And in the exhibition, we're showing um, several examples of these working proofs. Next slide, please. For the fifth Impressionist exhibition in 1880, for instance, she shared some of the fruits of this labor together with Degas and uh, Pizarro, displaying numerous prints, including working proofs of In the Opera Box that I'm showing here, alongside finished examples. With this act, she literally put on view as art the various stages of her intensive artistic labor, dramatically illustrating how she developed her prints, perhaps for the first time in the history of exhibitions. Next slide, please. As Cassatt's career advanced, her skill and ambition for her prints continued to grow. About a decade after her introduction to the world of print, she began to work primarily in dry point, a print technique that I'm showing you here that involves scratching with a needle into a copper plate that, unlike in etching, is neither covered in ground nor submerged in acid. The absence of distance between the hand and the plate results in a particularly frank and unforgiving medium, which records every line, and it's very difficult to make changes here. Um, and dry point became Cassatt's primary means of expression in print in the late 1880s. In contrast to the textured tones and bright highlights and rich, rich inky zones that I was showing you in the previous prints, Cassatt's dry points here exhibit a really stark linearity. And it was within this medium that Cassatt advanced an exploration of a new subject, and that's of the woman and child. Cassatt's dry points here mark a turning point in her engagement with the world of printmaking and debut a new manner of mobilizing its rich potential toward her own ends. Cassatt showcased her efforts in dry point in the winter of 1889 in the context of a group exhibition at the Durand Ruel Gallery in Paris that featured 353 entries or art submissions by 39 different artists. And Cassatt's dry points in particular were singled out for praise by Félix Fénillon, who Jenny was um, quoting earlier, one of the leading critics of the day, who remarked on the, quote, delicacy of the skin in the modeling of the mother's face and the downy head of the child in one of the works, works that I suspect um, uh, I'll be showing you in the next slide. I'll take the next slide, please. For the next exhibition at the Duran Royal Gallery in the spring of 1890, Cassatt, um, committed a larger number of prints, including a group of 12 dry points that I'm showing you here that she conceived as a set. Cassatt here dedicated her dry points to picturing women and girls engaged in various activities. Six of the 12 subjects show women tending to babies or toddlers. Another depicts two young girls looking closely at a map. And the remaining five prints portray single female figures. Two of these are seated, looking thoughtfully into space. The other three are occupied by a musical instrument, a mirror, and a parrot. I'll have the next slide, please. And I want to conclude today by pointing to the way that art critics at the time really struggled to explain what they were seeing in Cassatt's dry points especially. In fact, Cassatt's own hand became a, an especially vexed term among her commentators, forcing to the surface questions of gender and art making. Some writers saw in Cassatt a touch, sent, saw in Cassatt's touch 
one that was sensitive or feminine enough to aptly render her domestic subjects. Others drew really opposite conclusions, recognizing her dry point marks as unsettling, unsettlingly, quote, virile or vigorous or exhibiting a, quote, masculine talent. One New York critic described, quote, an amusing paradox in Cassatt's work, he went on to write, that her force, her penetrating vision, her technical clarity were wreaked largely upon the most fragile of themes, end quote. And another critic further unpacked this kind of mismatch between hand and subject, quote, Without bias, one is obligated to state that feminine works have an artificial allure, which shows their authors to be incapable of making an, an idea profound or of a feeling a form. One always divines in them a horror of truth and a searching for the pretty, which are at the heart of all feminine temperaments. In Mademoiselle Cassatt, there is nothing of all of this. She possesses a style of drawing that is precise and supple, and a frankness of execution worthy of a man, and a man of great talent, end quote. Here, despite both Cassatt's own gender and that of her subjects, the writer identifies her with a kind of male artistic genius, which is capable of rescuing the su supposed superficiality of her feminized material or subjects to deliver it to true aesthetic uh, contemplation. We can see plainly in this commentary how Cassatt's hand was at the time that she was active, far from a neutral or invisible topic. It was instead a key part of how her art signified. And equally fascinating, these critiques, as Jenny's already pointed out, occasionally spilled over onto the actual hands of her female subjects. For instance, one writer, as we've heard already, praised the quote, large hands, the beautiful masculine hands that Cassatt loves to give her women, end quote. In this example, Cassatt's artistic hand seemed to defeminize both her and the women she depicted. Cassatt's dry points achieve a remarkable sort of dissonant identity here in a way. A woman artist was seen to wield a man's hand, apparently to describe a woman's scene. And for me, Cassatt's hand in print is fascinating not only for its remarkable technical sophistication, but also its strange tangle of social meanings. Thanks so much, and I'll pass it off to Julia now. Thank you so much. And Tom, can you tell us what conservation has learned about Cassatt's work by looking at her prints and how that might relate to her hands? Thank you, Julia. As Terry remarked, conservators specialize in an examination of works of art through which we gain a deep understanding of artists' materials and techniques. Close looking at Mary Cassatt's prints reveal a facile artist who embraced the physicality of her materials as part of her creativity. In many of her works, the hand of the artist and her processes are a presence as strong as the subject depicted in her imagery. Each decision that she made when making prints, the choices of technique or the selection of certain printing inks and papers is an aspect of the artist's hand. Cassatt had a deep understanding of printmaking technology and consistently in her prints, she includes marks that serve as evidence or artifacts of her working process. As Laurel noted, Cassatt's long involvement with printmaking produced some of the most expressive and innovative works of art on paper of her generation. Printmaking may be thought of as a mechanized process, the final images realized with, through the intervention of a machine, the printing press. Cassatt's approach to printmaking, however, was not to pull repetitively uniform editions from her plates, but to embrace the subtle variations that occur when she printed on different types of paper or by modulating the application of her ink. The printing techniques that Cassatt favored, soft ground etching, dry point, and aqua tint, require several steps, both physical and chemical, to turn a metal plate into a matrix from which an image can be printed. Cassatt's prints reveal the work involved in making in their making as she leaves, leaves apparent traces of her involvement with each step of the process. In one of her early soft ground etchings, Lady in Black in a loge facing right. Next slide, please. 
there is a curious dark triangle of parallel lines in the lower corner. Under magnification, this mark looks like a partial fingerprint, as if the artist picked up the printing plate from the corner, making an impression in the soft ground coating before placing it into the acidic acid bath, acidic etching bath. Next slide, please. Similar marks appear in other prints, such as the soft ground etching in dry point, Marie dressing her baby after a bath. Here, the triangular dark shape stands out against the white paper in the lower corner. Although the mark is, is in fact not Cassatt's fingerprint, it is evidence of the artist's hand at work, as it was likely impressed into the plate from a clamp used to move the plate in and out of an acid bath. Next slide, please. A similar plate clamp is illustrated in an 1864 French etching manual by Adolphe Marchal Popemont entitled Letter on the Elements of Etching. On this page from the manual, Popemont shows a clamp being used to hold a plate while it is being prepared with a ground. But a similar clamp or pair of tongs would have been used to handle the plate in the etching bath. Next slide. Cassatt could have easily burnished or polished smooth these marks from her plates so that they would not appear in her prints, but she made the decision to live them, leave them in place. I suggest that she did this because she saw them as artifacts that reveal her process, testaments to the many steps and hard work required to produce her prints. Even in her great color print series, achieved through a combination of soft ground etching, dry point and aqua tint, we occasionally see the triangular clamp marks in the lower corners. This feature is noticeable here in this print, Mother's Kiss from the series. Next slide. Cassatt's dry points from metal plates drawn on only with sharp needles without grounds or the need for placing them in acid and consequently do not have these clamp marks. In Cassatt's hands, the dry point technique results in a print that is most like a drawing done in graphite or charcoal on paper. As delicately rendered as these images are, however, they are easily recognized as prints because of how Cassatt inked her plates. In these two dry points, the Caress and Celeste and Marjorie, she leaves a thin layer of ink on the plate surface, which imparts a slight tone to the composition. More significantly, she allows a heavier application of ink to remain on the beveled edge of the metal plate, which prints as a wide dark outline around her composition. Next slide, please. Printing plates, like this copper one shown here, are beveled along the edges so that they can pass easily through a cylinder type printing press. If the edges were squared off, movement of the cylinder would be impeded and the printing paper would tear along the plate edges. Next slide. Generally, printers will wipe excess ink from the plate bevels. However, Cassatt left ink on these edges. I believe that Cassatt did this intentionally to let the line serve as a framing device, which guides the viewer to focus on the composition within the larger sheet of paper. Additionally, by introducing this frame, Cassatt is again revealing her process. Leaving the lines of ink along the edges of the plate reminds us that we are looking at a print rather than a drawing, and that the means to create a print is complex and labor intensive. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Different materials and tools are employed to create a printing matrix when working in soft ground vert etching versus dry point. This also means that Cassatt needed to approach each of these techniques with a different touch or tactile sensibility. Here again is an illustration from Pokemon's etching manual showing a variety of etching and dry point needles, each of which were used to create different lines and textures on plates and which imposed different handling requirements on the artist. Next slide, please. The lines in a soft ground etching, such as this print, the umbrella, are dark and heavily applied on the paper. However, this appearance is due to Cassatt's choice to use a zinc plate and to expose it for a long time in the acid bath. 
The actual creation of the design on the plate was achieved by drawing with a light touch using familiar materials of paper and pencil. Next slide, please. Cassatt used a very different approach when creating her dry points, such as the print reflection. Here she would, have, she would have employed a heavier touch and a sharp needle to scratch the surface of the plate. The soft velvet-like appearance of the dry point lines is due to the interaction of Cassatt's needle and the metal plate. As she drew on the plate, her needle displaced filaments of metal along the edges of the line. These filaments, known as burr, hold additional ink, which diff diffuse the sharpness of the line and produce an ephemeral, ephemeral effect when printed. Next. Cassatt often combined these two techniques, resulting in prints that were the products of both her chemical and manual ma manipulation of the plate. In this early state of her print, The Bath, from her groundbreaking series of 10 color prints, we see how she used soft ground etching to compose the image, then reinforce her lines and dry point. In this detail, the etched lines are faint and resemble those done in graphite, while those scratched directly on the plate are dark and feathery. Next, please. The presence of Cassatt's hand is equally evident once Cassatt added aquatint, a tonal etching process to her plate. Here she hand applied color inks to the lines and tonal areas of the plates before they were printed. To produce an addition of 25 prints, she would have had to have paint on the, paint on the colors for each impression. Each print then, although derived from the same plates, can be seen as unique and display subtle variation due to the artist's technique, which treated each print as an individual creation from her own hand. Thank you. And as, as we wrap up, I was thinking, uh, you know, hearing the other, other presentations, um, we see, you know, the physicality and materiality in Cassatt's artwork. But I'm curious, does she ever, and I'm asking my other panelists, did she ever depict an artist at work? Do we ever see her hand holding a brush or a, a pencil? No. That's a great, that's such a great point and question, Tom. As far as I know, there, there, there are no photographs of her or any depictions that she makes of an artist at work, um, which again, is such a fascinating thing to think about because she is so, seems to be so focused on work and leaving signs of it in her art. I don't know, does anyone else have any anything that I've missed <laughs> with that? No, yeah, I mean, it's extremely striking that she never had her studio um, photographed, and yet we have these amazing records of her artistic labor with, in through printing proofs and the like. But the um, slide that we're showing right now, I think, is really interesting that she does show women actively making artistic projects or craft projects. This is one of our galleries where we've pulled together especially women and girls who are working with their hands on tapestry. This has come up in our other slides as well. Um, tapestry frames or sewing and embroidery. So they are in the act of making, but not in the kind of formal sense of a, a painter studio or something like that. And I think that tension between the kind of professionalism with which Cassatt um, approached her work and her kind of commitment to this is how she wanted to be understood. And yet she spends a lot of time kind of um, depicting other kinds of maybe amateur artistic engagement. Wondering if we should answer some questions that we're getting um, in the chat a little bit. Actually, Tom or Terry, would it make sense to describe what raking illumination is just because that's come up in our slides, just to clarify. Sure, I thought I I thought I mentioned that, but let me say it again. So, um, raking illumination um, is you have the light positioned um, from one side at an oblique angle angle for um, the paintings. We were looking at them with the lights positioned from the right edge or often from the top, and um, literally the light is raking across the surface, 
and it um, is very useful to see um, texture, to see the artist uh, uh, paint application. Um, uh, for Cassad, it was also interesting to see um, just the topography of the of the some of the paintings. Um, we were able to also see changes that she had made, um, and then you know we're able to explore those further with. Um, with infrared examination or um, X radiography, but it was surprising at how how much we could see just using um, simple raking light. And I should add that you know in paper conservation we often use raking light to, for similar similar reasons. And when we looking at uh, Cassatt's prints, and you can the way that they're the techniques that she used and and the the layering of the ink. And the full, you know, you can see, get a sense for the sense of uh, the pressure uh, of the paper being deformed as it goes through the press. Um, I always like to tell people, you know, a work on paper is not a two dimensional object. It is a three dimensional object. And that trick of our technique of using raking illumination helps us really appreciate that. It's interesting in the, in the exhibition, you know, the lighting is, is, um, set up and designed to be somewhat even, but sometimes I'll find myself standing in front of paintings and sort of bobbing and weaving and changing my position um, to create a sense of raking light so that I can see other things on the surface. Thank you, everyone. And um, we have um, about 13 minutes um, for more uh, Q&A. Um, Please put your questions in the Q&A box. If you see a question that you want to hear answered, you can give it a thumbs up. Um, and I'm going to um, uh, choose a question. Um, let me see. Were there other women artists engaging in printmaking during the same time Cassatt was actively engaged in printmaking? Mauricio Brockman yes. Gonzalez. Yes, certainly. Um, it was a path that other artists were choosing, um, and Cassatt was, yeah, among among many other women artists who were um, engaging in the world of printmaking. Mora so especially um, makes dry points like the ones that I was showing you by Cassatt. Um, Jenny can correct me if I'm wrong. I don't believe Eva Gonzalez made prints. Um, and Marie Brockamon certainly did. And in my own essay in our catalog for this exhibition, I actually sort of read a, a print by Mar Marie uh, Brockmann um, alongside one by Cassatt. So um, yes. Thank you for that. Um, and a question about subject matter. Why do you think she did so many pictures about bathing? I'll take that a little bit there. Um, she's not alone in being interested in bathers. Um, of course, many of her, her impressionist colleagues were interested in, in bathers as well. Um, I'm thinking obviously about Degas and about Cezanne as well. I I think, however, when you think ab about Cassad and, and she's very focused bathers and it's often children bathing, there was at the time a, a great deal of conversation about the importance of bathing almost daily um, and, and it's the importance of it, particularly for children in reducing disease. Um, so that might be one one aspect of, of her focus on that is that it was a um, it was part of a contemporary dialogue about ways in which in, you know children's diseases, infant mortality um, could be addressed, um, particularly in in France um, at the time. But she is um, you know she's she's part of a, a broader in, um, world in which um, our artists are are thinking about contemporary subjects, but also about subjects that give them an opportunity. Um, to to depict um, nude figures, because this is, of course, a long part of um, artistic tradition, um, particularly in France. And I think by Cassatt showing children being bathed, she's she's making it feel very modern and very relevant. Thank you for that answer. Um, and these are two um, related questions. Um, why did Cassatt focus almost exclusively on women and children? And in your opinion, how difficult 
or sorry, um, who were Cassatt's collectors of images of women and children? How was this theme received? Maybe I'll tackle the first part. And I think Jenny, you'll be great at the collectors part better than I can be. Um, I I mean, I think what has interested me, especially in the topic of, of you know, Kassat re recurring over and over again, you know, taking on this the subject of women and children. Um, this is this becomes a subject where she really does a lot of her artistic exploration. It's it's a subject where she feels, you know, the dynamism of figures engaging with each other, the kind of mixtures of bodies interacting, the kind of tender embraces and kind of I think it poses a kind of compositional challenge to her that she's that she wants to tackle again and again, and she wants to do it in new ways in paint and in print and in pastel. At least that's how I'm I'm thinking about how we can look at this subject matter. Um, and you know, this she is also surrounded by women and children that are in her family. These are um, the kind of scenes and spaces that she takes on as, as the ones that she wants to de depict in her art and the ones that she has access to as an artist. Um, so I think uh, there's a couple different kinds of answers to that question, but that's um, just one for me. And um, in terms of collecting, I'll hand it off to Jenny. So I... I have yet to do a comprehensive study of the, the first sort of buyers, uh, collectors of Cassatt's work. It would be actually a very interesting um, subject to think of research. I, I think our, our instinct is that the feminine nature of her subject matter would, would mean that it would be, might, might appeal most to, to you know, women collectors and we there certainly are a good number of of women uh, very sort of independent women forming extraordinary um contemporary art collections um i'm thinking here of bertha palmer um or louisine havemeyer sarah sears um in boston these are all um right the american collectors that i've mentioned but truthfully I'm, I'm sitting here making a list of almost an equal number of male collectors who i could point to you purchased some of these, you know, the, some of the very images that we've been looking at today. So I'm thinking of Harris Whittemore, Cyrus Lawrence. Um, so I think, um, I think in Cassatt's day, her images appealed to men and to women, and that it is part of our, um, we've become so accustomed to thinking that there's this feminine subject matter to Cassatt that must appeal only to women, that we forget um, the broader appeal that she had for collectors um, of Impressionist art in her day. And, and we hope, um, again, through our exhibition, we'll, we'll invite people to kind of step away from some of the sentimentality that, that has been kind of um, sort of tied uh, to, to Cassatt's work in the last several um, decades. Thank you. Um, this is a comment and then a question. It is interesting to me that we were talking about how she did not paint an artist at work while we are looking at a painting of a woman doing embroidery. Is there evidence of Cassatt recognizing works traditionally regarded as domestic and elevating them through her paintings or quotes? Um, sorry, I'm not following the last part of the question. So we're talking about an artist. And, sorry, could you repeat that, Julia? Of course, of course. Yeah. So the question is, is there evidence of Cassatt recognizing work traditionally regarded as domestic and elevating them through her paintings or quotes? Um, I, mean, I think that's largely what we've um, attempted to show in our exhibition is that there's again and again across her career, she's really... Um, interested in in showing um both kind of paid and unpaid forms of labor and we are really interested in the ways that she is sensitive to that in her kind of formal choices um like jenny shared in her presentation um and i saw in the chat um nancy mo matthews who is a towering cassette um scholar that we're lucky to have in our audience reminds us that there is a really amazing um watercolor self-portrait by Cassatt. There's only 
um, a very few self-portraits by the artist. And there is a suggestion that she is actually in the course of painting. It's a, it's a watercolor. Um, it's not, there isn't a kind of full view of her studio, but she is likely um, painting or watercoloring. And so that's a good reminder that, you know, at least one self-representation does hint at art making. And I also just wanna point out one more self-portrait that's really been um, convincingly argued by another scholar, Nicole Drajopoulos. Um, uh, the dry point actually, if Julia, if you wanna go back to it, Tom shared it in his presentation called Reflection. Um, Nikki Georgopoulos, um, convincingly this one here, um, suggests that this might be another self-portrait because of the, because, for many reasons, which I won't all go into here, but um, it's possible to imagine that she's looking at a mirror. That's why we have this kind of direct gaze out and that maybe the kind of blurry hand that we see could be a kind of hand that's, you know, busily sketching her own image. Um, so I just wanted to kind of thread a few things together um, and, um, go back to the idea of Cassatt's own identity and the way that she's picturing herself very rarely as an artist, but there are some instances. Thank you. Um, was Cassatt's focus on strong, supple hands ever inspired by works of sculpture? Would she have been familiar with Rodin's sculptural depictions of hands, for instance? I'll, I'll, I'll tackle that. Um, she certainly knew um, Rodin. She, she writes on a couple of occasions about seeing um, Rodin's um, sculptures and, and in particular comments on a bust um, of the uh, um, American railroad magnate um, Harriman at one point. Um, and so certainly Rodin was very much um, someone she would have been aware of in Paris. The it, a very interesting um, comment about Rodin's hands, the, the sculptures um, that we actually have on view right now um, at the Rodin Museum in Philadelphia in an in in installation. Many of the pieces that Rodin makes that are sculptures solely of hands, of using this sort of fragmented body part to become the, the expressive subject of an independent um, sculpture, are pieces that he makes in the early years of the 20th century. So they would actually post-date many of um, the works that we've looked at on the screen today. So um, I, I think we might be thinking more about something that's perhaps in the water um, in Paris as, at, at the time, and, and that they're, they're just two artists that are thinking about this theme rather than it being a direct relationship between one or the other of them. Thank you. And a question, I think, to end on. Um, in your opinion, how difficult was it for Cassatt as a woman artist during the time when she worked and lived? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's what our show is trying to tackle again. I mean, um, it was... Uh, it, it was difficult, um, but Cassatt was afforded great privilege as, as a woman of a certain class and as a white woman artist. Um, and we acknowledge that and, and sort of talk about the way that her own social position um, provided her access and then also, you know, was limited by the kind of social codes of Paris and the kind of spaces that she could literally occupy or not. Um, and one of the ways we've been thinking about that is that Cassatt had a kind of remarkable, I think, commitment to professionalism and work. This was kind of the, one of the attachments and um, big commitments that allowed her, I think, to kind of um, move through the world. It really, it became really fundamental to her identity and the way that she um, lived her life. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Laurel, Terry, Tom, and Jenny. Thank you to the Diskant family. Thank you to everyone who made today's program happen. And thank you all for attending. There will be a follow-up email to everyone who registered that includes a link to the recording. We encourage you to visit the exhibition Mary Cassatt at Work, which is on view now. We also encourage you to attend another program related to this exhibition that's on July 20 in the PMA's main building, and that is 
the Roz M. Perry Memorial Lecture, Artists at Work. It will be a panel of three local women identifying artists discussing their creative practices while reflecting on Cassatt's professional life. We hope to see you again soon, whether at future programs or in our galleries. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you.